I'm David Crosby at Virginia State University. What we're doing is we got a series of uh, programs related to aquaculture and homesteading. This is the first one in the series. Uh, today we're gonna have Cynthia Gregg. She's gonna talk about what is homesteading. Then we're gonna have Brian Neary, who's at Virginia State University. He will be talking, give an overview of what aquaculture is about. And I will come in lastly and talk about cage aquaculture for rural areas. So, so basically this is aquaculture for homesteading, uh, rural and urban. Uh, the next program, the next series, the next Tuesday, a week from today, where I have one strictly in aquaponics, and that's going to be Chris Mullins. Uh, we gave him practically a whole hour because uh, it's so intensive information, he needs that much information. The third in the series, we're going to talk about uh, uh, RAS and fish health and water quality, recirculating systems, tanks, uh, water quality, and, and fish. And after that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, fee fishing, uh, safety, uh, marketing in the last program. Um, a lot of folks that gets into homesteading, they sometimes look at what kind of uh, markets they can sell their product. Because a lot of folks, you know, get into it, and it becomes a, uh, a, a self-reliance uh, operation. But sometimes they try to look, what do I do with excess? Can I make a little bit of money to help support my my home setting. So that's going to be our last session. And there's been a flyer sent out. So please register for it. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia Gregg, who's our a great extension agent from Brunswick County. I've known her for uh, 25, 27, 25 years. Oh, yeah, getting close to it, Doc. Yeah, so. So she's going to cover what, what is homesteading, and then Brian's going to come in and talk about uh, overview on aquaculture. So let's get going because we don't have that much time, and I appreciate everybody who showed up today. Uh, thank you, Doc. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to this Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, series on homesteading with aquaculture, and I will get Mark to go ahead and start the slides. So next slide, please, Mark. Okay, uh, homestead is defined by Webster's, it's a noun, it's known as a home or adjoining land occupied by family. It can be an ancestral home, uh, house, the house and farmland, a track of land, uh, it could have been U.S. public lands years ago when they actually had the Homesteading Act and the Great Land Rush. Then also as a verb, it means to occupy that home or homestead or settle the land as far as under that homestead law. But it can also mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in an urban and or rural setting, you can actually be able to utilize the resources you have to help supplement your family's food and resources and even some other things, uh, maybe your financial that kind of thing. So next slide, Mark. And then we got aquaculture because we're talking about homesteading with aquaculture. And it's defined uh, by Webster's as the cultivation of aquatic organisms. It can be fish, shellfish, and that is for food. So what we want to do is that can be accomplished in many ways. And we're gonna learn that in this series because it can be inside production or outside production. So Mark, if you'll... So with a lot of people staying home a lot more because of the coronavirus, uh, there's been more interest in raising your food at home. That way, that interest has actually been in fruit, vegetable, uh, herbs, and even meat. And fish and other aquatic species can be added to that meat resource protein for your family. So it's happening all across Virginia. And I don't know if you've seen a lot of information or a lot of pictures, but there's a lot of folks across the Commonwealth for gardens, whether it be in the ground or in containers or raised beds. They're also utilizing uh, small greenhouses and they're also not only growing plants in those greenhouses, but also uh, fish in those greenhouses. And there's a lot more creativity going on. 
So Mark, if you'll go to the next slide, slide please. And I apologize uh, as far as my sound, because I think there was some things here in the, with the storm. I had trouble getting my computer up this morning, so I apologize if I'm, you know, it might be better with another, so I apologize. Okay. Okay, uh, Mark, can you come back one? I think I wanted the rule of, yeah, there we go. So, Ponds can be used for your uh, for families, for their food, uh, and even developed into a business, as Dr. Crosby was talking about earlier about even fish out programs. Uh, you can fish uh, with a pole, uh, rod and reel. You can raise fish in a cage and you can dip them out as you need them. Um, then you can also sane out of a pond. But what you can also do is there's trout raceways that are utilized for production in trout in the mountains. Uh, there's also, um, you know, that's where the water is cooler. You can also raise fish in tanks in a greenhouse, especially warmer watered uh, type species such as tilapia. So it depends on what you're looking at. So there's a lot of different ways that we can approach that in a rural setting because we have a little bit more room. But Mark, if we go to the next slide and talk about the rural, the urban setting. You can actually have the gardens in your pond, uh, in your backyard and a small fish pond. Even in a small greenhouse, you can grow things like vegetables, herbs, fruit, and you can have a fish tank in there. So, but your footprint's gonna be a little smaller. So it's gonna be depending upon the size of your yard, your porch, your patio, even a balcony and apartment. So whether you can put in raised beds, uh, containers, smaller gardens for your fruits and vegetables, and with those fisheries, you can also use smaller tanks or even water features that may be a way to grow those fish for your family. So there's a lot of different things you can do, and you can even put in a small greenhouse in your backyard to be able to do that as well. So Mark, if we'll go on to the next slide, please. So a lot of people want to know what can you grow in an urban homestead? Well, you can add edibles to your existing flower beds, whether they be herbs, vegetables, even fruit. You can also erect a small greenhouse in the back yard or the side yard. You can start transplants in them. You can even grow vegetables and fruit in them and possibly put that small fish tank in there. But remember, your temperature is going to play a factor into which aquatic species are going to be growing better and what you'll be able to utilize during a certain time of the year. It depends on if you can heat or cool your greenhouse, those kind of things. And if you use containers, be creative. Um, I've actually seen folks use the uh, pallet that's there and, and actually do different things, turn them around the other way close off the bottom, fill them with soil, and put herbs on that way. But I'm trying to give you a few, you know, it's not all gotta be horizontal, you can use vertical. And don't also forget the herbs, depends on how you like to cook. So Mark, if you'll go to the next slide. As we talked about a little earlier, you know, your urban footprint's gonna be a little smaller, and it's gonna depend on the resources you have available. Some things you're going to be able to grow seasonally. Some things you may even be able to grow year round. So it's really going to depend. So as we talked earlier, that greenhouse, if you have one, it's going to depend on how you can heat it and cool it. You know, can you put a fan in? Do you have a ways to put a swamp cooler in it in case you need to cool it off a little bit more? Do you have a way to put heat in? And you do not want to use something like one of those propane, uh, heaters that you put on the tank because that gives off a gas and that can mess up your plants. So you want to make sure you just put the heat in there. So, so it was really going to depend on what you want to do. So use what you have and, you know, dare to be innovative. Try something new. Use your imagination. Sky's the limit. So we'll go to the next slide, Mark. And as far as we're talking a lot more about urban homesteading, a little bit more, that's going to be more of an emphasis. But, you know, you, as you know, you can supplement your family's food resources to stretch those dollars. 
right now with everything going on, that's something we need to learn about, you know, or have an opportunity to do is stretch our dollars. We can learn new skills. And that's something that we can not only with the production of the fruit, the vegetables, the herbs and the fish, but you can also learn how to preserve that. And we do have some opportunities for you to learn about canning and freezing. Also, you know, adding something new to the family's diet, having the family try something new. Uh, you know, tried trues and all the news. You can try it out and see what folks like. And plus, that's going to give your family an opportunity to exercise, get out and do some things. Because, you know, with everybody staying inside, we're all becoming couch potatoes, and that's not a good thing. And hopefully that will also strengthen your family as you're learning new skills together. And it can be economical. And the other thing it can be is it can be fun. It can give you a new hobby. It can help with your health. It can help with so many things and also be a little fun. So we'll go to the next one. And as Dr. Crosby talked about, you're going to learn some things in this series that hopefully will help you develop some plans that you want to do in your own backyard. So we're going to talk, you know, he said that Chris is going to be doing some programs, Chris Mullins. They're going to talk about tanks and other water resources you may have, uh, how to even set up a tank. The other thing is, is oh, some folks don't know that they need to get with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, which was formerly the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, to get some permits for certain types of fish. And we're going to talk about that through this series. We're also going to talk about water quality because you want fresh water that is a, not full of ammonia, those kind of things, so that those fish will stay healthy. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about some handling and storages and some other things that will hopefully help your program be a success and have an opportunity for your family to have some new things. We'll go to the next one. So some things that you might want to consider adding to your homestead is it could be a backyard garden, it could be some containers, and as Dr. Crosby said, Chris Mullins is going to talk about some hydroponics. And you can use those for fruits, vegetables, herbs, and even fish. So there's going to be a lot of topics that we're going to be talking about during this series of four programs. So Mark, we'll go to the next one. Some other things that you'll be able to learn about is learn about this aquaculture part of a homesteading program. So you can stay engaged with this four part series. There are some opportunities that have been available and a lot of those are recorded on gardening, uh, containers, uh, raised beds, that kind of thing. A lot of agents have been doing that to share. If anybody's interested, you can check out the ext.bt.edu website and there will be some of that will can pop up for you. Uh, hydroponics, I do know that Chris Mullins has been doing some additional programs uh, above and beyond what he's going to talk about in this series. So you can actually give that a try and look at them and do what else you can learn. And then with that, we'll go to my final slide. And thank you for letting me give you kind of a brief introduction about what homesteading is and a little bit more in depth of what we're going to talk, talk about. If there's any questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, Mark Kleeman and I will be monitoring that. And with that, let's start the series officially. So Dr. Crosby, Dr. Neri, I do, I'm going to yield the floor to you. Thank you, everybody. Brian is up. Right, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are, we're fortunate today, uh, but uh, we have a one year study that will be done in 20 minutes. So, and I think what we'll do is just go through the list of um, what I'm, um, we'll cover there is, is the fish and other uh, aquaculture products that we will be working with. The permits as Cynthia talked about, different types of production systems, fingerling sources, and a little bit on feeding and aeration, you know, water quality. Um, 
just doesn't make any difference what size operation you have, uh, you still have uh, the same types of, of inputs in, that you need to deal with. with. With homesteading, we're looking at relatively low density. So uh, what that does is reduce the risk of diseases and other problems that can occur. Um, and certainly that still requires you to have your best aquaculture practices. And they all will change depending on what you are working with, uh, the type of, of fish or shrimp or crawfish that you're working with. Next slide. So the inputs that we're talking about is certainly you need to have water, whether it's a small uh, uh, tank or whether it's the pond in your backyard uh, or, or uh, uh, you might have a, a flowing stream through your property. Uh, the fish or shrimp that you may be uh, working with, water quality, I'll focus primarily on dissolved oxygen, which is the one water quality parameter that's, that's most important. Um, and uh, the feed aspect of it, depending on how much you use, that will impact on the ammonia, uh, which will, will be covered when we talk about feed. And then just management. And that requires some sort of observational skills. Uh, get to know your system, know what will go wrong. A, a typical ex example would be today. N no one would expect to have a hurricane blow through your system, or at least you're unprepared for it. So the next slide. All right, some equipment that you may or may not need. Uh, that oxygen being important, depending on the size of your operation, is a dissolved oxygen meter. Uh, certainly record books uh, to keep track of, of costs or what your, uh, your, your records of water quality. Um, just like any type of business operation you have, you need to have some sort of record of what you're doing. Even if you're not on a business scale, just uh, temperature uh, readings that, that will give you an idea of, of uh, some relationships. Uh, a scale, if you're going with a fee fishing operation, such as uh, uh, David had re referred to before, uh, you need to be able to weigh those products. Uh, and if you have just a pond for your own recreational enjoyment, you need to have a camera for a couple of reasons. One is to take a picture of it. And I think I, I think I put a, uh, a, a uh, website at the bottom there where you can how to make yourself look better by making the fish look bigger than it really is. And certainly having fishing rods, dip nets, buckets. And another important thing is the safety consideration. Uh, anytime you're around water, and certainly if you have electricity around water, you need to have uh, some idea of, of safety, um, letting people know that you're, you're working around water so that there can be uh, less of, of uh, potential for problems. Next slide. So uh, there's the lowest end of aquaculture, which basically is pond management. Uh, you have your basically uh, your predator-prey relationship with your largemouth bass is the usual predator. Uh, and that largemouth bass uh, is stocked and controls the prey, which are the bass, are the bluegill and red ear uh, populations. And so there's a consistent amount of, of production that's taking place in that pond. And you can throw catfish in there also to add to the mix. But that a typical one acre pond in Virginia has less than 100 pounds of fish per acre. So that you really, it's not an unlimited supply and by keeping uh, a constant balance, you're able to enjoy, uh, you can reap the natural production of that pond in the form of an animal protein of fish. Next slide. And, and th that can be done, and these are some guidelines in terms of when those fish should be stocked. Uh, and we'll talk about where those fish would be obtained later on. Next slide. So with a little bit more management, you can start looking at uh, increasing the productivity of that body of water. Uh, and generally we're talk 
talking about relatively small body of water, a half acre or so in size. And this could vary in terms of the type of organism that you're raising from freshwater shrimp, which is a tropical organism. So it's looking at from May until September. Uh, you may have a water garden uh, or some sort of ornamental fish that you have, goldfish or koi carp. Uh, then you could have a larger body of water where you have uh, catfish or hybrid striped bass. Uh, in this case, this is an operation of Barrow Pit down in Charles City County where uh, uh, it continues to expand and uh, some the people who fish it benefit from it. And then we have other operations. Uh, uh, this is, I call it the downstairs tilapia production down, of Isle, down in Isle of Wight. Uh, and I say downstairs only because anytime you have a, a, a tank with water in it, uh, a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. So if you have a 50 gallon tank, you're talking about a lot of weight. So you generally don't want to have that in an unsupported uh, floor of your house. Next slide. So uh, several people have ponds where they have either hybrid striped bass in the ponds or in cages. And David's gonna be talking about cages, whether it's for uh, uh, catfish, hybrid striped bass uh, in, in the summer growth period. And then during the winter, you go with rainbow trout, which is our winter crop here. Also, you can raise rainbow trout indoors during the winter. Uh, in an unheated greenhouse, uh, which, which certainly uh, provides uh, a use of that colder water. Next slide. So the catfish population, once again, in ponds and in cages in ponds, you can see on the left-hand side there, the feeding activity that uh, uh, the, the ripples on the water with a floating food so that you can observe the fish eating that indicates the health of the population, good water quality, and growth, because you have a two to one feed conversion approximately. So for every 100 pounds of feed you give to that population, you have about 50 pounds of fish growth. So you can actually grasp uh, the growth of that population in the pond. Next slide. Well, this is what Cynthia was referring to before in terms of the permit requirements. Uh, relatively inexpensive in Virginia compared to other places. Uh, the, it costs $10 a year in annual fee. And these run from, I think, October until September of the following year. Uh, and if you notice on the right-hand side, uh, uh, the sunfish, including crappie, bass, and bluegill, uh, can be grown as a food fish. So there is a, uh, we're expanding the, the possible, of the 20,000 or so fish species out there, we've increased it by three here in Virginia, at least, in terms of, of, of fish to be sold as, as a, a food fish. Next slide. You also can uh, run a hatchery type operation, which costs a little bit more, $12.50 a, a year. And I think on the right-hand side, you see that uh, there, there is a mention of uh, the blue catfish, which is a, 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 a species that is no longer desirable in Virginia. Uh, if you read about the excess quantity of, uh, of fish being, or natural populations of fish in the James River being inundated or at least out consumed by these 100 pound blue catfish that might exist in that river. That's why they're restricted. Next slide. Uh, and then we start getting into the co complexity of uh, the permit process. Hybrid striped bass, which is a derivation of the striped bass, which is, a, which is considered a marine fish the Virginia Marine Resource, Resources Commission uh, is in charge of uh, the permit for those. Uh, the uh, striped bass, uh, the hybrid striped bass, which is normally a cross between the white bass and the striped bass, uh, is not considered to be 
a, a fish that we, you would like to be released because it's still viable, it still can reproduce. And so it's restricted as where it can be grown. Uh, they just don't want any chance of escapement. Next slide, please. So where do we get these uh, fish or other uh, organisms? Well, I mean, the first thing is a reputable source. Uh, uh, there are several places, the fish wagon, which comes out of usually Arkansas that brings uh, catfish and some other species uh, into the area uh, and, and sells fish in parking lots of various agricultural outlet stores. Uh, they are, uh, they have a history of, of supplying a good quality fish. You also have local uh, hatcheries that do supply fish throughout the state. Uh, you also can go to these hatcheries. I know that Perry Middle Farm, which is down in Windsor, down 460, uh, they, uh, you can call them up and, and you could go down there and pick up fish and you could stock them yourselves. Uh, you can see on the lower left-hand side here, you have a picture of an individual who has rigged up a hauling tank on the back of his pickup truck. Uh, so it's basically a, a, a 200 gallon tank with an aeration unit on it, battery run. So he, he's able to haul fish from wherever, in this case, it was a drop-off point from the fish wagon uh, to his pond, which may have been in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then you have the middle picture is uh, your typical aquarium bag. These were fingerlings that uh, could be picked up at the hatchery and then carried by the owner to the pond. Typically, you'd stock them early in the morning when it's cooler uh, so that you don't put any additional stress on the fish. Each of these uh, bags is filled with water uh, and usually saturated with oxygen so that the quality of the fish uh, they're healthy when they get there and you have to spend some time uh, mixing the water in the bag with the water in your pond so that they're, usually it's the temperature that's the biggest factor, but generally you could have alkalinity differences, but generally just that it's slowly mixed together and everybody, should, all the fish should be happy. Now on the right hand side, this is uh, uh, the operation that would supply rainbow trout to producers uh, uh, outside of the north or the western part of the state, they would bring the fish to uh, the eastern side for operations to run cage culture of rainbow trout during the winter months. Next slide. There are people who actually produce their own offspring, and this is once again the, the Rosenfelds down in uh, uh, Isle of Wight County. And they uh, are able to uh, not only produce tilapia, which they sell through one of their community food groups, uh, but also they have uh, production of uh, baby fry fingerlings, which they will put into a separate tank that are available for sale through other operations. Plus, they can restock themselves. So they're basically self-replicating themselves and all of this operation is running downstairs of their house. Um, that's with tilapia. Next slide. So what type of production systems are out there? Certainly there are indoor tanks, such as we just saw, ponds, cages in ponds, and then you have a pond cage combination. And then we'll talk about entrapment zones which are somewhat like raceways that we, we Cynthia mentioned. So the, the downstairs, uh, I guess it's called, next slide, yeah, you were right, next slide. And this is the uh, uh, tank system. Uh, they have expanded to six different tanks now and they're using these uh, IBC units, which is like 250 or so gallons uh, that they're able to produce. A, 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 a different size group. Each tank has a different size uh, uh, tilapia so they can manage the stocks um, to move consistently into the marketplace. Next slide. The next slide is pond culture. And these are just, uh, I guess I'm putting a focus on fee fishing only because uh, if you are a limited size 
uh, homesteading type operation, uh, you may not have a, a, a large operation or your ponds may be in, in hilly areas where you don't have a lot of, uh, of potential for expansion. Well, this is out in Lee County, which is basically a part of Virginia south of Detroit, the farthest western part of the state, where uh, uh, they're able to raise catfish in, in ponds and, and uh, people will come to fish them out. Uh, and on the right hand side, this is a, a, a pond raising rainbow trout, or not rainbow trout, uh, uh, and this should be catfish and rainbow trout during different parts of the year. But it provides a recreational aspect to fee fishing. And, and uh, depending on the figures, it's a big money maker for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And certainly at this time of social distances, distancing, fishing seems to be one of those operations that works out fairly well. Next slide. And, and David will talk about this. And this is, uh, if, you, if you notice this, the quality of, of cage culture, uh, floating cages with floating feed. And you have uh, either you can buy the cages or under the guidance of, of the, the extension agents around the state can have some cages uh, self-made. Next slide, please. And this combination of cage culture and pond culture, and this was an operation in Orange County and it's been done elsewhere, where he raised hybrid striped bass in, a, in his pond. He'd come home from work and uh, he or she would fish them out uh, and uh, catch and release and release them into a uh, uh, cage by the side of his pond and at the on Friday he had a, a running order with one of the local white tablecloth restaurants and he would just dip out the hybrids from his cage and bring them to fresh from his pond directly to this white tablecloth restaurant so he was I think this was several years ago was making twelve dollars a pound or so for the fish so it's quite lucrative on a small scale next slide and this was a modified stream. And this was just a stream. This is in uh, Abingdon, uh, where he had uh, rainbow trout in, this, uh, in a stream, flowing stream. He has bird netting over the top of the stream because if you have a concentration of fish, you do have to be concerned with possible predators. Uh, the same type of concept can be done in, in large bodies of water where they have my, an inlet where you could fence off an inlet and put fish inside that inlet and feed the fish in that inlet and raise them to a, a larger size. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> By far the most important water quality, uh, important quality is the feed management. The feed is about 50% of your operating expense for aquaculture. Uh, you need to know where the feed is coming from. Uh, generally, you'd like to use a floating feed only because the floating feed allows you to observe the feeding activity. And that is a, a, a management tool that you'll know that the feed is being fed, you know that the water quality is good, and that your population is healthy. Uh, the feed needs to be stored in a clean place, dry, uh, where you don't have a lot of insect problems. Or, or other or rodents. Uh, you would rotate the inventory just like in your refrigerator. Uh, that feed that you purchase is, is a complete food. And depending on what type of fish you have or shrimp that you can buy specifically for the type of, of animal that you're trying to raise. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So uh, if you notice on the right-hand side, <clears throat> you notice a couple things. One is the fish are doing the backstroke, which indicates that there's a problem. Uh, and the feed that you, is a floating feed, is floating. It's not being consumed. That's a problem. So the management, <clears throat> you make those observations that you do have a problem. On the left-hand side, you see active feeding activity, which is desirable. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So how do you feed them? Well, in 
outdoors, you can actually feed them by hand. Uh, it's it's an action. It's um, it's desirable to observe the feeding activity. And on the left hand side, you see a belt feeder, which is typically used indoors with tilapia. Tilapia really don't have a big storage organ and big stomach so that they feed constantly. That way you're able to, this belt feeder will drop pellets on a slow basis constantly over an eight to 12 hour period, depending on the type of belt feeder you have. So you have a constant amount of feed available for the fish to consume. Next slide, please. Or you could just manage a natural pond. This is a crawfish operation on the Eastern shore of Virginia where basically they maintained uh, cattails as a source of, of, of the root systems, the types of organisms that, that crawfish will eat. And so by setting traps up, they were able to harvest the crawfish and move them to the market that way. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Water quality issues, the most important thing is, is oxygen. Oxygen is needed to uh, not only for the fish or organisms to stay alive, but to process that food. Uh, so you need to have as high a level of con concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water as possible. On the left-hand side, this is a, a tank system uh, uh, where you have uh, basically, well, it's dissolved, it's air being blown through a diffuser into the tank constantly. And on the right-hand side, that's a vertical lift pump, which not only aerates the water, but pushes it out so that the pond is being mixed. So you're not just aerating one area. Next slide, please. In tanks, you'll see uh, a couple of things. One is, is a tank system on, on the left, the, the fish are being fed. And on the right, you see diffused bubbles. Uh, the, the finer the bubble, the more dissolved oxygen is going to be mixed in that water. Uh, these large bubbles that pop to the surface are just aerating that one column. Next slide. So, and, and this I think may be my last slide, but this is what, uh, in terms of, of homesteading, in terms of the type of fish that can be used this is uh, uh, the tilapia. And on the left, that's just a, a growth curve that, that uh, was uh, released by the Philippines that just showed from uh, over a, basically a, well, it's, it's 120 days, which comes out to be four months. Uh, it went from hatching up to over 250 over 250 grams, which is bigger than half a pound. Uh, and these are, uh, on the right-hand side, these are some fish that we produced at Virginia State University uh, and provided to uh, uh, the food bank over in Petersburg. But they are uh, fast-growing, desirable, uh, forgiving in that the homesteader can make mistakes and still have success. Thank you. I think that may be the last slide. Maybe. Okay. So any questions, just uh, either put them in the chat box or, uh, you know, we can get to them later. Thank you. Mark, Thank you. if you could, Mark, you can bring mine up now if you like. There we go. Okay. Let's get started. We're getting close to uh, running out of time for our, our uh, session here. What I want to do is talk a little bit about cage aquaculture, and this is going to be mainly in the rural section. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot of farm ponds out there, and these farm ponds can be utilized a little bit more than just recreational fisheries. You can increase the production capability of these ponds by putting some cages in there. But not all ponds are suitable for this. Next slide. I uh, want to make sure we have enough water flowing into these uh, ponds. We want to be able to have a sufficient watershed 
for these ponds when we do put cages in there. Uh, forest requires a lot bigger watershed versus uh, land that's in pasture. Uh, we're not, we have uh, water coming in from limestone deposits, which is going to increase a certain water quality parameters that makes these ponds far more productive. And we'll be talking about alkalinity and hardness. Uh, you might have to worry about uh, lowering your ponds. Uh, example today would have been a good time to lower your ponds by a few inches just to make sure that uh, you don't get water overflowing the emergency spillway because we got a six inch dump of rain in 30 minutes. So sometimes there is a time that you do lower ponds, but mainly you don't do that because you never know when you get re them refilled. Again, Avoid pastures with manures. This is nutrients that's going into the pond that can produce uh, unwanted organisms or plants in that particular uh, pond. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a quick overview. Uh, I'm not going to cover it, but basically the species we're looking at is channel catfish, hybrid, uh, rainbow trout and bluegills uh, using cages. The photograph that's on the left is a guy out in a boat in a cage uh, taking care of it. I don't recommend that. That's an example of something we don't want to do. Next slide. Okay, site selection. Uh, if we got a pond that's an acre or so, uh, it's an ideal pond for candidate for doing cage aquaculture. Another thing you might want to look at is don't have any electricity that's uh, available to that pond for aeration. Because as we mentioned earlier, uh, aeration is important for uh, putting oxygen into the water which fish needs. The other thing is, is it's going to be easy for us to uh, get to that pond with feeding and harvesting. Uh, do we have any security from theft? Uh, in the past, we've had a lot of folks lose whole cages because people go down to them. Uh, remember one incident, there was a, a, a five acre pond that had a bunch of cages and it was in a place where nobody knew where it was. You really would have had it known that there was cages out there and they, somebody came in, sold all the fish out of those cages. You definitely want something to attach your cages to, not up here. You want some clearance between the cages. And the most important thing is that you want to have some clearance between the bottom of the cage and the bottom of the pond. And lastly, let's not have any cows in the water. That's not a good idea. Next slide. Okay, here's some example. There's an example of a pond that you don't want to go into. Some ponds that you need to evaluate. And some ponds look great for, uh, for putting ponds out. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some examples of cages and docks. You can see some have uh, electricity for aeration, some don't. We want to make sure we got some separation. Some people use PVC collars to try to help separate the cages. Cages can be square, they can be round. Next slide. Here's some more examples. Uh, you go stock these cages out. You want to make sure the fish come live. This is a nice five acre pond. They got some aeration. A pond like this, you probably can get away without any kind of aeration. We don't have to have aeration if you're doing a couple of cages, but if you start doing a lot of cages, you want to have some kind of aeration. And we talked about cage placement. I have an example in the lower left hand count, uh, slide where uh, somebody tried to put a cage in a stream. Uh, the first uh, bad weather, like a hurricane came through, uh, washed everything away. So this is not what you call an ideal situation. I don't re recommend that type of cage placement. Next slide. Uh, okay, species that we want to do. The first species that we want to do for cage, if you're going to do cage aquaculture, and this is uh, highly recommended for first time uh, people who are doing cage, is rainbow trout. Uh, 
you got to have to buy them live. They're not cheap. You know, they're running over a dollar a fish nowadays. Uh, you're looking at trying to get three to four fish per pound for stocking. Next slide. Again, they're fairly easy. Uh, they tend to have a higher potential for marketing. It, uh, and they grow in temperatures uh, between 50, 60, 65 degrees. But there's a certain lethality when temperatures get too hot for them. Uh, they tend to have a higher protein diet and higher fat, which means that the feed costs more money. So there's a more... Uh, costs in buying the fish and feeding these fish. And uh, those are going to be your two main costs, uh, fingerling costs, fish costs, and feed costs. That's going to go into the production of these fish. But if you go to uh, buy rainbow trout filet, you're talking about $10 a pound. Most of, we, most of the time we're going to uh, put this into a, a cage around end of October, first of November, and hopefully by April 15th, we can take these out. Next slide, please. Okay, catfish, this are our next best bet for cages. They're fairly more easier to get. Um, uh, you, you tend to have a bigger fish for cages. Typically, if we were stocking a, a, uh, a pond with these guys, just a straight catfish pond, we probably do about six inch fish. But if you go in, into a cage, we're talking about a much larger uh, fringling. Next slide, please. Uh, they're, they're fairly easy. Uh, Again, we're stocking these ponds, but if you're going to a cage, you want to go at least with an eight inch finger in that cage, maybe even 10 inch. We're talking about 100 fish uh, 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 per thousand pounds. Uh, the, the feed is fairly cheaper than, uh, than you get for, uh, for uh, rainbow trout. You can, in fact, get your feed at most uh, um, tractor supply, feed stores, southern states, and it can run anywhere from $17 to $20 a bag for 32% protein with about 6 to 8% uh, fat in that. And typically, you want to get a small uh, um, feed size. They come in two different uh, types of feeds. One, one's called Little Striker or Fingerling's feed, which is high protein, which is 36. Then you got your regular grow out feed, which is around 32. Next slide. Uh, another species that we could probably look at uh, for stocking cages uh, is hybrid striped bass, but you will need a, a permit for this particular fish in your ponds, and you would have to have some uh, structure to prevent escapement of the fish from the ponds, and you would need to get a special permit from Virginia Ma uh, Marine Resource Commission. Uh, at, I think there, there might be a charge for it now. It used to be a free, but uh, there may be a charge for this nowadays. Next slide. Uh, it's a, just a cross between a, a, a white bass and a, a pure uh, striper, and it's a fairly involved production scheme that results in several stages before we get uh, a fish. You probably want a fingerling that's five to seven inches if you go put it in a cage. Next slide. Okay, uh, here's the one that we are uh, trying to work at, uh, trying to develop some production uh, methods for trying to improve on is the bluegill. Uh, this is one species of fish that is not being raised in Asia. So we have a complete marketing uh, advantage with this uh, bluegill. Uh, there are, people love them. I like bluegills. Uh, they're really nice. You can uh, process them in many different ways. You can fly them. You can hope, hope uh, whole fish it and, uh, and take the skin off or cook it with skin. There's many ways of cooking this, and it take and it has the same length of of uh, grow out as you would for a a, a, a 
catfish. It takes about 18 months to grow these up to about a pound and a quarter, three quarter pound is what you're looking for for, for this. Uh, they spawn in the, in the uh, summertime, uh, July, June, when water temperatures are hit around about 75 degrees, you see these spawn in your ponds. Uh, next slide. Okay, cage design. Cage design is very variable out there. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, design structure. Here's a one that's square, has uh, PVC pipes uh, surrounding it. Uh, that particular structure is more expensive because the amount of PVC and materials going into it. Uh, square cages tend to have corners, and corners is where fish can get crowded up into. So a cage like this can run around $400 to build. A round cage uh, is cheaper, and there's no uh, corners in it, so fish never get bunched up. But these are fairly cheap to build. These things can run from $100 to $200, depending on your materials. Ideally, is that you want a half top that you can open up to get into it. You don't have to have the whole top uh, enclosed. Just make sure you do a half top. Make sure you have a flotation device. And the main thing is what you want is make sure that to the freeboard from the top of the cage to where it floats, you at least have uh, maybe up to six inches, four to six inches, because you don't want to have the, the uh, top of the cage at water level. Next slide. Okay, this is an ancient uh, cage de uh, design that was very popular uh, when I came to VSU. Uh, uh, you can see that it's a little stick man diagram that everybody used. We don't quite go that way anymore. We got a little bit different way of doing things. Next slide. Okay, here we got folks uh, building cages. We used to run uh, cage building workshops, and we had one kind of planned for this year. And unfortunately, a, we had a virus come into town and wiped us all out. Uh, so we couldn't do this particular cage. Uh, but basically, you know, you want some rooms uh, using half inch mesh. Uh, they come in 50-foot rolls. They're four foot in, uh, in, in width. And you want a half inch. Uh, you want PVC pipe. Poly pipe is three quarters inch. And, and usually we want uh, one eighth inch mesh, half inch, and three quarter. Next slide, please. OK, just some math here uh, <laughs> so we can uh, do things. If, if you want to figure out the circumference of a circle, you need to know the radius. Now, do you know how to do the, uh, the uh, uh, area of a square, of a circle? It's just a pi r squared gives you the area. But anyway, this is important because when you're cutting a polytube, you want a, a, di a diameter of four feet, you know, or a radius of two feet. So this calculates the length of the pipe. Now, Basically, this is going to be a 12-foot radius. So if you cut the, the sides for it, you have to have some overlapping. So, you know, you don't cut 12 feet worth of, um, of, uh, of your poly netting. You cut maybe 12 and a half feet. You want to make sure you, when you bring your material around the circle, you have overlap. Next slide. Okay, cage construction materials. We want some kind of top. We're going to use some kind of plastic netting material, half inch, 13 feet, like I was saying, because you want that overlap by four feet, because your diameter, your circumference of that circle is going to be 12 feet. Uh, tops, uh, you know, I would make it out of three quarter inch mesh, and the reason for that is it allows for feed to easily fall into the cage. Uh, everything else is half inch to bombs, half inch size, half inch. Another important thing that we want to do is add a smaller mesh uh, 
material around the top edge of the cage. And I got 18 inches, they come in 36 inch widths and by 50. Again, you cut 13 feet, 18 inches, cut them in half, you come around. This is gonna prevent the feed from leaving the cage, which is important. Because if you didn't have that in there, cage would escape out as a half inch mesh into the water. And if this is in a pond, the bluegills that's in the pond would love it because they will come to the cage and try to get what they can from your feeding of the cage. Uh, poly tube, three quarter inch, some connectors, bracing materials, PVC type works great. Uh, floats, uh, there's many different ways of doing the floats. Uh, people use uh, swimming noodles, which won't last a season or so. There's other materials a little bit more expensive that you can get that runs about $4 a, a piece. And, if you're going to have any longevity, it's best to spend a little bit of money up front so these cages will last for five to six years. Next slide. Okay, here's an example of a home built design, innovative design with an automatic feeder and square cage, different kind of flotation system. You know, put fish in there, put the feed in there, and you come back when it's ready make sure you keep it full but there's all different designs different innovations uh different thoughts uh, you just have to get creative when you do these cages and if you have questions about uh design get a hold of us and we can tell you we're not we think it's a, a excellent design good design or we don't think it's going to work next slide okay uh here's something that is part of our uh, production methods that we're trying to do on improving. This is not exactly a new innovation, but it's been around, but it's been uh, overlooked a lot in the cage production system. Uh, this is what we call using an airlift pump. You were talked about using aeration to move water. You would think that the flow of water going into a cage would be very easy. Well, it's not as simple as that. Uh, cage materials, there is some resistance, and what we want to do in a cage, when we got fish in there, we want to make sure the water quality, oxygen levels are very high in there. If we're pumping water from outside the cage into the cage, we're bringing good, uh, good water quality into the cage, flowing it in there, making sure high oxygen level and no poor water quality exists. Uh, simple aeration system. Uh, PVC pipe. Uh, this is two inch PVC pipe. We're using a T connector on this pipe. Next slide, please. This is an example to show how it works. Air comes down, pumps big bubbles in there. You want big bubbles, not small bubbles. It comes up and it flows right into the cage. Different designs here, T's uh, and different angles. This is a T design I use right here is one that's straight up. Uh, again, you can, uh, different compressors, you have to make sure the, the pressure or compression of the air is it's going to be sufficient to go down the length of the pipe and push the air up. If you don't have a good enough compression, the air will not come up. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing, I don't have a photograph. I just got a schematic design that's set up here. Uh, you can, air, in pond raceways has been a big topic, real hot topic. Uh, you can build a cage, uh, a rectangular cage, and basically I'm looking at a four foot by four foot by six foot in length. You can put a bunch of airlift pumps in one end and run the water and flow it just like an air rate, uh, like a raceway. And since you got that fine mesh going around there, that's going to act like water resistance. So it's going to go hit the back and come down and out. So this is something you can look at. And this would be probably an ideal cage for maybe putting hybrids in there or even trout. You can increase the production of a uh, of your pond in a cage like this. You know, you could probably put up a thousand fish into a cage like this if this was set up correctly and flow and give you that kind of production on a cage production in a pond. Next slide. Okay, 
different sizes, different size number of fish. You know, we want to make sure we get enough fish into the cage. It's real important with uh, catfish to get sufficient numbers in a cage because if you have real low densities in a cage, catfish will fight each other. So we want at least six fish per cubic foot of water. Uh, typically, we stock a round cage with 250 to 400. To, we put at least 300 catfish in. 250 trout is what we usually shoot for. Next slide. Okay, here's an ideal situation here. No aeration, but there's a lot of good elements here. We have a nice steel metal can, net, good dock, good separation, large pond, not that many cages. Uh, this ca these cages can hold 250 trout or 300 some catfish uh, in there, and it does a pretty good job. This system works real well. Uh, again, you know, the still cans right there with the feeds, that keeps the uh, raccoons out. So if we we're doing catfish, six fish, we probably want at least 100 pounds per thousand. Uh, 10 inch fish is good. And the trouble is if we get any smaller catfish in these cages, when we stock them out in March or April, if we do small catfish fringlings, uh, which are cheaper than larger ones, larger ones go cost money, you can end up uh, overwintering the fish. We want to try to grow these fish from uh, March and try to get them out in October. If we can do a March to October, then we can come back with trout maybe. Next slide. Yeah, we're starting to run it down. Again, eight inches, uh, one cubic foot of water, 7.48 gallons of water. A round cage with the freeboard gives you about uh, 50 cubic feet of water, 374 gallons. And again, next slide. Okay, feeding. Uh, volumetric feeding is what we're looking at. You see a little measuring cup. This is the simplest way to feed your cages and figure out how much feed that you should give. Uh, keep records, uh, measure your cup, see what a half cup weighs, what a full cup weighs, and, and that's how you re record it. I fed my cage two cups, write that down. But you know how much, how much feeds in two cups. Next slide. Again, uh, Make sure you have a good protein for your uh, uh, fish. Feed by satiation. Uh, when you're feeding catfish, see how much they eat in five to 10 minutes. Uh, again, volumetric measures, what we use. We try to feed about around two to 3% body weight during the summer. Always feed some during the winter months. Uh, feed every day that you can. Next slide. Okay, trout. Uh, we put trout at the end of October, early November. Again, we're putting only three to four fish per pound. And we're looking at eight to 10 fish per cubic foot of water. In a four by four cage, we're looking at only 250 fish. That does very well. Next slide. Again, trout feeds. We've got a better feeding table for the trout. Uh, when you start getting up to around seven degrees, you know, they're eating a lot more percent body weight. You know, 56 to 53 is a really good uh, range. So it's 50 to 55, two to three percent body weight. When it starts getting cold, you know, we do want to feed, but we don't feed as much. We don't feed as many times per week. So we get this pretty much during uh, March and April. And we also get this in November. Next slide. Okay, keep keep records. How many fish did we put in here? What did they weigh? What size? When we harvest, get the weights and number so we know what size of fish that we harvest. Next slide. Okay, water quality, go for this real quick. Next slide, please. Uh, again, two things we're gonna be looking at is hardness, alkalinity. We probably want to uh, checked it a couple times a year. If we're doing uh, hybrid striped bass, we probably want to add some gypsum for the calcium form. It also helps with muddy ponds. Next slide, please. 
aeration, we already talked about that in depth. You want some aeration to move water into the cages. Next slide. Okay, alkalinity. We want to make sure we have good alkalinity in the water. 20 parts per million is adequate for most uh, management. 50 is better. Calcium uh, carbonates is what we add, ag lime. We do that in the fall. It helps moderate the pHs of the pond. Next slide. Hardness, uh, we want to make sure we get some calcium in the water. It's very important for hybrid striped bass. If we're going to have hybrid striped bass, we should try to have it close to 100 or so in hardness in the water. Again, lime, agricultural lime will help increase that. Or gypsum will do the same thing, which is calcium sulfate. Next slide. Yeah, I'm going a little bit over. Uh, we talked about predators. Uh, if you even have cage culture, uh, it tracks other fish to the cages because of the feed, and you might see a blue herring hanging around. You can see this blue herring got a nice size catfish in its mouth, and it's going to enjoy that meal but you won't next slide and here comes our predator can control angry bird to chase these guys off next slide uh, next slide okay now uh, we do get no matter what form of production systems that we do there's always um, opportunity for diseases and poor water, water quality to result in some kind of fish kill. Uh, monitor your cages, monitor your ponds, monitor your tanks, look for any sick fish, remove dead fish promptly because they could be a source of pathogens for the rest of the fish in the pond and cage. Next, next slide. Again, you know, you got some fish, you, you're raising these fish for your own use. Uh, and you don't have to have a permit uh, for, for uh, catfish, bluegills, or trout if you're using them for your own use. The only time you're going to need a permit if you decide to start selling them as a way of making potential uh, income to help support your homesteading activities, then you're going to need some permits like uh, Brian was talking about. Next slide. Again, when you see a meal like that that you produce, that that's me is marketing. You're making money. And some folks, you know, uh, develop little restaurants based on the uh, production of their fish in their ponds. Next slide, please. Quickly here, uh, if you had one round, no, no, I'm going over a little bit, uh, one round cage, say with catfish, uh, you know, you get 400 pounds worth of fish in there, uh, and, you, and uh, this is just easy calculations here. You can produce maybe 100 pounds worth of fillet. You have some costs in there. The biggest cost is going to be your, your fingerling and cost production. There's some other costs in there. So if I wanted to make $15,000, if I had one Doc, we lost you. I think I think what he's, what he's going to say is that you can make hey. money in this one. Yeah. Uh, currently at uh, at Wingman's, if you walk into the uh, seafood counter, uh, you will see well-caught uh, blue cats, which is in the rivers, and that's a commercial fisheries that's out there competing against anybody raising catfish, and it's running about $10 a pound uh, for, for flight. But this is just uh, just to give you an idea how to calculate. This is rough. You know, you still go get two pounds of, uh, uh, go take two pounds of feed for every pound of, of, of uh, flesh that you produce. So let's just try to give you an idea how things kind of run here. Next slide, please. I think we're getting to the end here. Oh, questions. Well, hey, Doc, uh, I guess, Dr. Neri, this was to you, but I guess either one of you can answer this. Why are people saying tilapia is not a healthy fish? No, I've already sent that back to her. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Okay. Do you want to share with the group? Yeah. Well, I think there's two questions with in terms of the tilapia health question. One is, uh, uh, some people have read there have been reports that they're raised in sewage lagoons in Asia. Um, and certainly they may have in the past, but any fish that is moving into the U.S. through some legitimate restaurants and, and grocery stores are, are quality controlled. So that doesn't exist. The second question was the omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid ratios uh, compared, say, to salmon, which I think is the most often compared. Salmon have a much better omega-3 fatty acid content compared to tilapia. Uh, and they, there are reports that the omega-6, uh, the higher levels of omega-6 fatty acids in tilapia are bad for people. Well, the question is, if tilapia was your only source of, um, of fatty acids, if that's all you ate, then perhaps that'd be true. But omega-6 fatty acids are also required. Um, so you need to have uh, a, a uh, uh, so don't eat only tilapia, but certainly eat, uh, 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 as most food people will say, eat a wide variety of fish. And certainly a, a tilapia is a good source of protein, a good source of uh, of, of low and cholesterol, and certainly a, a relatively inexpensive uh, source of animal protein. So that that omega six omega three fatty acid question is 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 uh, not really you should not be concerned about that. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions? That was the only one I saw in the chat. What about you, Mark? Uh, the only one was if, if we're going to make these available, make these uh, presentations and the links available. Yeah, we'll be doing that. Uh, it may take us uh, a couple of days uh, to get them edited and that kind of thing, but uh, we should have them up. And Mark, uh, I guess we can send out the links when we get that done. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Neri and Dr. Cross, we want to do them all four at the same time or do each individual session. I don't know. I think we're going to do each individual session okay. to make it easier to uh, download and get a hold of. And also Mark is putting this, is using YouTube to, uh, to uh, get the co closed caption portion of these videos. And that's something that we got to have done before we can uh, have them available. Folks, so it takes a little bit of time before Mark runs this for the system for us. And we depend on Mark for a lot of things nowadays. Yeah, that's, we're required to have subtitles so uh, yeah, it takes about a week or so. But if you yeah. signed up through the, and, and, uh, the C event, then we have your email and we'll send you a link when the, this is ready. We can also send you the presentation. And in the meantime, if anybody is wanting our presentation, I will make a, a, uh, a PDF file of my presentation and email it back to you. That way it gets to you easy and you can actually see it in case you don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Usually when you said PowerPoint presentation, it's, it's so heavy in uh, size, it's hard to send, but uh, converting them to PDF files allows the ease of sending them by email to folks. So if anybody would like to have a copy of this, please e email me and I will send you a copy. Okay. 